All right. Um, welcome to our Bible study tonight. Let me just, uh, before I continue, let me uh, link it up on Facebook as well. Uh -huh. Oops, I was logged off actually. Let me log in. Uh, okay, here. Oops. Da, na, na, na. Is 35. I'm trying to log in here so that I can uh, also log in on Facebook as well. Six, 22. I just logged off from Facebook. Hope you're having a good day. Um, let me fix this, share to my news fluid, all right. My day was really cool. Uh, I've had a brilliant, brilliant time. And I'm um, looking forward to this Bible study to also be a good one. Uh, let me type this. Mm. Tongues to prove I have Holy Spirit. Okay, so. Uh, if you follow me on Facebook, you can uh, check the same. Uh, I'm actually going live right now. Uh, my, my Facebook is Keith Muoki, K-E-I-T-H-M-U-O-K-I. -E you can follow me on Facebook um, as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Hope is live actually. I don't know. Let me just confirm. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's live right now. So uh guys, I hope you've had a good time, a good day. Um uh, just confirming if everything is fine. Yeah. Actually, everything is fine. Let me just uh, close a couple of things here because I'll be, uh, I'll also be sharing my screen in a bit. So uh, you can also follow with me as well. Um, I love using this Bible, which is called the Blue Letter Bible. I don't know if you have used the Blue Letter Bible before. This is usually my favorite. Whenever you're, you're learning something or you want to search something, that's, that's the best kind of Bible that you can use. So uh, enough said, um, let me get on this, uh, let me get on this. Okay. So now tonight I'll be speaking about a topic about the Holy Spirit. So, do you have to speak in tongues to prove that you have the Holy Spirit? Is it a must that you speak in tongues? And then at least people can know you have the Holy Spirit. This is, the, the, there is a new teaching within the Pentecostal church, which uh, tries to say that unless you speak in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. You have to speak in tongues for the, you know, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit to be shown that uh, you have the Holy Spirit. And, and I also struggled with this so much. Uh, when I was in the Pentecostal uh, movement, I, I, I was always 
all the time there. And uh, I had this pressure from my friends, from family that, Keith, you have to speak in tongues. You have to speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then there's something really wrong with you. You've never received the Holy Spirit. And uh, it really bothered me so much. And I, I remember I went to so many meetings and I tried to uh, have people lay hands on me and uh, I tried to fall down. I tried to bu bubble, you know, like the, most of these guys they try to do. And uh, it was not really possible for me. It was really, really difficult for me. And uh, I used to ask myself, why is it that I'm not seeing this? Why is it not happening to me? And uh, later on, I came to discover that uh, the Holy Spirit is a bit, it's a, uh, th there's something different in um, you receiving the Holy Spirit. It, it has nothing to do with uh, speaking in tongues. So uh, tonight, I like us to speak uh, about uh, this topic of uh, when do we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Actually, that should be the mini, uh, <clears throat> mini uh, topic. So I would like to ask you, when do we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Uh, first and foremost, let 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 me share my screen here and uh, be able to show you something here. Uh, okay, so we see in First Corinthians, First Corinthians twelve, uh, thirteen, First Corinthians twelve thirteen, it tells us something here that uh, we need to check. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Okay by one spirit okay you see there's a capital s here so it means that the is speaking about the holy spirit the holy spirit of god okay and then we see for the uh, for for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free or have and have all been made to drink into one spirit so all of us have been able to be made to drink from the same spirit, the same spirit of God. So now that means that we are all under the same spirit the moment we become children of God, the moment we get saved, we are all under the same spirit. So uh, there's no one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit as long as he's been saved. Why? Because in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 13, it tells us about this. Ephesians 1 13, it tells us, in whom you trusted, okay, after that you heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, okay? So we are getting sealed, we get the Holy Spirit of promise the moment we trust. We trust after we have heard, okay? After we have believed, we have trusted. Believing and trusting is uh, the same word. So immediately we believe, then we get sealed by the by the Holy Spirit, who we were promised. Okay, remember Jesus before he went, he said that uh, I am living right now, but I'll not leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to leave you uh, uh, to 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 bring you the Holy Spirit, who will abide with you forever. So the same Holy Spirit is the one that was promised, and we see He's sealed inside us the moment that nanosecond that we believe okay so now like we see here the order of salvation for you to be saved uh for you to be uh, declared or to declare yourself or to god to declare you to be saved then you must hear the gospel and you have to understand the gospel and then you believe and you are sealed with the holy spirit of promise okay so let, let let's see what this gospel you see paul has told us the gospel of your salvation so we have to see exactly what is the gospel the gospel is found in first corinthians first corinthians uh, 15 1 through 4 uh, and it says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Are you seeing the gospel is mentioned here? I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received and wherein you stand. Okay. So you are standing in that gospel. You're standing in a gospel. You're standing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. So it's, uh, it's very, very important to understand what you're standing on. You're standing in the gospel. Okay. Uh, and then 
which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. So you standing in the gospel, by which also you are saved. So what saves you? You are saved by this gospel. You are saved by this gospel, okay? Uh, being saved by this gospel, it means you have to do something here, okay? Listen, for I deliver unto you first that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So before we even come to how Jesus died, we see you are saved. If you keep in memory, you keep in memory something. So how do you keep in memory something? Unless you have believed, you can never, unless you have understood, you can never keep in memory something. Remember when you were in school, uh, the teacher used to tell you, please don't cram this, understand this. He used to tell you, do not cram, understand. Why? Because unless you understand, there's no way you can say you have kept it in memory. There's no way you can be able to say that uh, this thing is already in my mind. No, how? Unless you have understood. That's why the uh, uh, Jesus most of the time used to say, unless your, uh, your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the uh, Pharisees, you can in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't see the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because uh, these people, they knew the whole law, but there's not even one day that they could be able to understand and comprehend on this because they are not digested the same because unless they digest it in their minds that's the only time it will come into their hearts and this is very very important to try uh, uh to tell people about concerning understanding the gospel so let's continue uh, from where we were so uh likewise romans 8 9 it's also telling us something here okay concerning the holy spirit let me show you Romans 8, 9. If you have a Bible, you can go there. Uh, Romans 8, 9. It's telling us something here concerning uh, uh, the Bible. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, is he is none of his. You cannot be of God when you don't have a spirit. You see, this one is already explaining. So for those who say that this is a born again Christian, but uh, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit, then it means there's something wrong. There's no way you can say this person has, uh, is, is born again, but he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. How now? The Bible here is telling us, if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his so if you don't have that Holy Spirit, so what is this work of the Holy Spirit? What's, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit uh, have to do with us? What does he need to teach us? The Holy Spirit teaches us. He teaches us several things. He teaches us the Bible. We can be able to understand his word through the Holy Spirit. You try to read and learn and do this and that, but you don't get anything because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Before I got saved, it was very difficult for me to understand the Bible. I could open the Bible and read over and over again, and I was understanding nothing. But the moment I got saved and the Holy Spirit was sealed in me, I could understand the Bible so fast and so easily. So the Holy Spirit, unless he's in you, then you're not a born again Christian, okay? So that means he doesn't come at a certain time. The moment you believe, he sealed in you. So he doesn't come at a certain time when maybe some person lays their hands on you or something happens, no. Uh, let's see also another verse here. Uh, there's also another verse here, which says in uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, 21, Second Corinthians, uh, sorry, I just opened 12. Uh, Second Corinthians uh, 21. 20, 21. Did I open my own things? Maybe verse 1, if I'm not wrong. I don't know. Maybe I can try and recheck this one. No, let me... Let me just type this and check it out. Uh, it is God 
who makes uh, both of us and uh, you stand firm. The good thing with the blue letter Bible, it helps you to understand the Bible and it helps you to, uh, this one actually should be from NIV. I don't use the NIV actually, but uh, I saw this one somewhere. No, it is God. No, it is God who makes both us, you and me stand firm. I saw this uh, from a friend of mine who was uh, teaching and he was teaching, uh, oh no, don't tell me there's not that verse. Anyway, let me just paraphrase it because I don't want to take much time. The Bible says, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 1, 21, verse 1, or 2, 1 to 22. I don't know exactly, but I'll paraphrase. It says, now it is God who makes both of both us and you stand firm in Christ. He's appointed, he anointed us, set his seal of ownership uh, on us, and uh, put his spirit in your hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what what's to come. Now, the Bible says that he has put a deposit of the Holy Spirit in us, okay? So we already have the Holy Spirit, immediately have been saved, immediately have been born again. We have the Holy Spirit within us, okay? That one is already explaining to us, there is no place that we will be waiting later on to receive the Holy Spirit in, an, in a specific event. No, we already have the Holy Spirit the moment you've gotten saved, okay? And also we can see in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Bible tells us something here. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and which, which uh, you have of God, and you are not you are on. So your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it means the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit dwelt in you and he lives in you. And where he lives, it means this body, the body that he's living in is not even yours. It is the body of God. And he lives inside there. You see, there are people, so many people have been arguing and others saying, you see, uh, the church is where God lives. No, God does not live in houses made by, you know, wood and sticks and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, sand and cement. No, he doesn't live there. Actually, he has said that he doesn't live in houses built by men. He lives in, in our bodies. That's exactly where his temple is. So meaning we already have the Holy Spirit within us. So if he's in our bodies, then it means he is with us. The moment we believed, he has lived with us, okay? So nowhere do we see also Paul saying that uh, some Christians uh, have the Holy Spirit while others are waiting to get him. We don't see that anywhere where Paul is quoting that, okay? So uh, we can say also, uh, people can be asking, so where do we get... Where does this confusion come from? I just uh, written about this here uh, so that I can be able to show you. There's so much confusion and people say, you see some people have gotten the Holy Spirit, others don't have the Holy Spirit, others, this person has the Holy Spirit, this one doesn't have, this one has never been laid on hands, this one has been laid on hands, he doesn't get it, he gets it. And uh, I was confused as well so much. And I used to ask myself, when will I ever receive the Holy Spirit? When will I ever get the Holy Spirit? Because in the in most churches, like I told you, there is that confusion and people get so much confused on the Holy Spirit and when you get him, okay? So in the book of Acts, we see places where uh, people are being filled with the Holy Spirit and that's where the confusion comes in, okay? So first you have to understand, what is the difference between being filled by the Holy Spirit and the spirit dwelling in you. What is that difference? What's the difference between this? You 
being filled by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. First and foremost, in dwelling of the Holy Spirit, this one happens the moment you are converted at the moment of conversion. That is according to Ephesians 1.13. The moment you believed you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the indwelling of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit, he comes inside you the moment, just exact moment when, when you do what? The exact moment when you believe, that is when you get the Holy Spirit. But the feeling of the Holy Spirit it happens when we are fully under the control of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The more you hear about the word of God, the more you get close to God, the more you do things of God, and the more you, uh, you submit yourself to God, the more the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is filling you. Okay, you remember there are places whereby we see so many times, like even we see Peter, uh, the Bible says, and Peter, filled by the Holy Spirit, went and did A, B, C, D. Already controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what it means. Being controlled by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit controlling him so much, he has already given himself to the Holy Spirit. Then he did A, B, C, D, which was boldful, okay? Remember, in the book of Acts, the Bible says, uh, you, you will receive you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Okay, so the Holy Spirit gives us power to do things. He gives us a lot of uh, power to be able to push through situations, to go through different uh, difficult uh, times and things like that. Even to go and preach the gospel. Remember the apostles; they were much scared. Remember Peter, the apostle Peter, he was so much scared when Jesus was being, uh, was going, being taken to the cross. He even denied him three times. He could not want to be, uh, be close to him because he was fearful. But the moment he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he went out so boldly and uh, he was speaking and he was being beaten and he still woke up again over and over. Look at the apostle Paul, look at the other apostles. They were even killed mercilessly, but they could not stop. Why? Because the Holy Spirit inside them, the Holy Spirit inside them gave them boldness, okay? How? Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit through uh, giving themselves to the things of God, listening to the word of God, listening to God, and uh, giving themselves not to walk in the ways of the flesh, but to walk in the ways of the spirit. When the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and telling you, read the Bible, do what is right, walk in, uh, in the, the righteous ways, and you listen to that and you continue doing what is right, then the Holy Spirit fills you. When he fills you, you'll feel bold and you'll feel I can go and do all things through Christ who strength, uh, strengthens me, okay? And that's why in Ephesians uh, 5.18, let me show you this. In Ephesians 5.18, Ephesians 5.18, uh, Ephesians 5.18, it tells us something here. And be not drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So Paul is saying, don't get drunk in excess with wine, okay? So this is explaining, there are so many people who are getting too much drunk excessively with wine, and they were forgetting themselves. You see, the whole aspect of getting drunk, it's what the Bible really refutes. Remember, there's, there are so many incidences. We see even men of God, people who are uh, called by God, they got really drunk and things worked out badly. Look at Noah. Noah, he got too much drunk and he, and, and he went naked in front of his, uh, his children. But that doesn't mean that he was an evil man. No, God hates drunkenness, okay? But remember one thing. The Bible tells us one thing that uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you really have to be filled, then be filled by the Holy Spirit. So instead of being filled with things of this world and things which are vanity, yes, uh, we have seen different examples, even Paul telling uh, Timothy, uh, uh, get a little wine for your stomach. Uh, he's telling uh, uh, different people concerning wine. He's also talking about these things. But now what you have to understand on this aspect is, 
the drunkenness, the losing of your mind, because when you're really drunk, you lose your mind. And when you lose your mind, you cannot be able to make a clear judgment between right and wrong. Okay. And that's why you have to draw a line be be between drinking and getting drunk. And if you cannot be able to understand how to make that line, then you rather stay away from the whole thing. So that's why Paul is really, really uh, focusing and telling us that do not be drunk with wine, wherein excess, okay? He's saying in excess, but be filled by the Holy Spirit because the moment you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he's able to control your mind. Don't let any other thing, don't let even food control you. Don't let even money control you. Don't let even business control you. Don't get drunk. Have you ever heard people who say, this guy is drunk with money. This guy is drunk with the wealth. This guy is drunk with this and that. He's saying, don't let other things get you drunk, but be drunk by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit of God, okay? That is exactly uh, what he's uh, speaking about. So when the Holy Spirit indwells you, he basically, when the Holy Spirit indwells you, he, he basically becomes a residence. When he indwells you, Ephesians 1.13, when he comes inside you, when he, he's sealed inside you, he becomes a resident. But when he fills you, he becomes the president. He becomes the leader of your life. He's the one leading you in every situation. So when he fills you through hearing and hearing the word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, okay? When you continue hearing the word of God, when you continue submitting yourself to God, now the Holy Spirit takes control of your life. And he becomes the president of your life. So there are a couple of confusing verses, especially in the book of Acts 8, 14 to 17, and also Acts 19, 1 to 7, where uh, the Bible is, is talking about some people who were filled. Uh, I mean, they, they got saved and then they spoke in tongues. And uh, one thing you have to understand, if you you're reading the book of Acts, you have to understand that the book of Acts is a transitional book. It is transitioning from one style, from one uh, dispensation to another dispensation, from the dispensation of the time of the law to the dispensation of the time of grace. Remember in the early parts, in the, uh, in the early book of Acts where Peter and the early apostles are preaching, they are still preaching about the kingdom of heaven. Remember Peter himself, he, uh, after, uh, after the, the, the day of Pentecost, that day, and uh, when they were there, the, the, the people came and they told them, and uh, Peter started preaching to them. He told them, the Christ, who you people? Because he said, men and brethren, men and brethren, what were the brethren of uh, Peter? Peter was a Jew. He was talking to his brethren. He said, men and brethren, you killed your Messiah, but God raised him again. Okay, so you have done a very bad thing, killing your Messiah, you Jews. Okay, so you're speaking to the Jews. And then they were preaching their hearts and they said, what shall we do now? And he told them that repent and be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So most people take that and they say, this is for me. Repent and be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No, that one is not for you. Why? Because this was speaking to the Jews. And he was saying, men and brethren, you killed your Messiah. Now, let me ask you, you're a Gentile in Kenya, in Uganda, in US, wherever. Did you kill Jesus? Literally, because this was a literal thing that he was saying. Stop saying that, oh, he said it spiritually. No, it was a literal thing. Did any Gentile kill Jesus? No, Jesus was killed by the Jews and the, and the religious leaders and the Jews. They're the ones who killed him. Okay, they told uh, th those their leaders to kill him. They're the ones who shouted and said, we want Jesus, release Barnabas, kill Jesus, kill him. His blood will be on us. And now the Roman soldiers, they went and did as, as they've been told. So these people, they spoke in unison and they said, we want the blood of Jesus to be on us, okay? Not in the aspect of saving them, but in the aspect of, you know, the guilt, let, him, let the guilt of killing him be on us. So they were pricked. They were pricked about this and they felt bad and they said, oh, what did we do now? What shall we do? And he told them that. And we also see different places uh, in the book of Acts where people are bet, uh, getting saved and also they are 
uh, speaking in tongues there and then. But remember, like I've told you, Acts is a transitional book. And our today's doctrine does not come from the book of Acts. It comes from the Pauline epistles. That is Romans through Philemon, okay? So if you really want to learn today's doctrine, according to our dispensation, you have to follow Paul. Because even the Bible says in Romans 2, uh, Romans 2, 16, Paul says, in the day when God shall judge the whole world according to my gospel, so the gospel that Paul was preaching is the one which will be, you and I will be judged, anyone who has lived during the church age, okay? And uh, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That is Ro Romans eleven thirteen. 13, is the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. So unless you understand this, and unless you follow this, and you follow the today's doctrine from Romans till Philemo, then you're following something a little bit off because the transition part, happened. Jesus himself, he said, I did not come, but unto the lordship of Israel. He did not come, but he was only speaking. He, he did not come to the Gentiles, but he came to the lordship of Israel. And that's why Jesus was saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand, it means it's already here. Okay? Okay? He said, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's at hand. Okay? Welcome, welcome. I can see you. So now, the thing that you have to understand here is Jesus himself, after he was, uh, he was rejected by, the, by his fellow men, kin, uh, kindred, the kingdom of heaven was postponed to the millennial time. And right now, it is the kingdom of God, whereby the, uh, the message of today was revealed to the Apostle Paul. So Apostle Paul was given today's message on what exactly people should do to be saved. And that's why when you get saved right now, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven. You enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is within you. He says the kingdom of God does not come by observation. You cannot say it's there or there or where. It is within you. And also Paul says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. That is exactly what the kingdom of God is. You become a member of the kingdom of God, okay? But later on, Jesus will come to rule literally here on earth at the kingdom of heaven, at the throne of his father David for a thousand years. That is the kingdom that he was to establish. So that's what I'm saying. As is a transitional book, you have to understand this one very clearly. It's a transitional book. You have to be very keen as you understand this. And as you say, oh, I'm not speaking in tongues when I've just gotten saved. And why this, why that? There are so, also so many other places that uh, we see that not all uh, places in Acts, actually I can say this, not all places in the book of Acts, we see people getting uh, saved and speaking in tongues. No, because speaking in tongues, as the transition goes on, we see that speaking in tongues actually is fading out. And even Paul himself he says, I, I would rather I prophesy than speak in tongues. If it was speaking in tongues, go and read uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Paul says that if it is all about speaking in tongues, I, I can speak in tongues more than you. Actually speaking in tongues, is not only just the vain babbling that people do today, it is literal written and spoken tongues, written and spoken words. Go and see in the book of Acts chapter two, when the, the day of Pentecost, these people are speaking in tongues, what were they speaking? They were speaking literal languages that someone can hear. People from Medes, from Rome, from, I, I don't know, they were saying from uh, all those places, those people, they had them speak in their own tongues. So if they had them speak in their own tongues, what, what, what does it mean? It means exactly what it says. They were literal spoken languages, not the vain babbling that people do today. And then they say, oh, we are speaking in tongues. And how can you really say that you can teach someone speaking in tongues? It's not possible. Yes, sometimes you can find yourself speaking in tongues because uh, it's a it's a it's a is said in, in the book of uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, that uh, these are heavenly languages and all that. But there are also rules on how you should speak in tongues. If you speak in tongues in church, there should be a translator. There should be a translator who is saying, 
okay, the, what this person has said, it means A, B, C, D. And those translators should be at least two or three so that there's no scam. That is exactly what the Bible is saying here. The Bible says exactly that. Let's just see. Let me show you this before I even continue because some people might be wondering, Keith, are you really saying the truth? In 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I start from where. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me start from verse 13 because I don't want to take much time. Let me show you exactly this. Listen to what Paul is saying. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. If you pray in a tongue that you cannot understand, then, you know, your spirit is praying. Or, uh, yes, your spirit is praying accordance to how you feel and how uh, intense the prayer is and how you're weeping. Because the Holy Spirit can see your intention, can see our hearts, okay? But what is it then? Will I... Uh, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with understanding also. So he says, it is better for you to pray with the spirit and also with understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with understanding also. Else when thou shall uh, bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupies the room and learn it say amen at, at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what you say. So if you pray in tongues, you say, oh, you say all those things that they say, riba kasa and all, and all that, I don't know how to pray in tongues. Now, immediately you're finished praying in tongues. How will those who are with you there say amen and they have not even understood what you've said? You say amen is saying, we agree. We agree to what you've said. Now, how are we agreeing and you have not heard? For thou verily givest thanks well, but others is not edified. Yes, you yourself, you may say, oh, I prayed in tongues because of what I was feeling. I could not open my mouth. I could not say anything else. I had to, I had to pray in tongues. I didn't have any other way because I was weeping. I was feeling, but how will others say amen? It is only you who gave thanks well, but the others were not even edified. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. This is Paul saying, myself, I can speak in tongues more than all of you here. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I may teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. You see what Paul is saying? I rather speak in things which people can hear than 10,000 words in words which people, nobody can be able to understand what you're saying. Okay, look, brethren, be not children in understanding. How bait in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Stop all these gimmicks of, hey, I'm speaking in tongues, I'm doing, come on, be men, speak, speak what people can understand, edify the church. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak unto these people. And yet for all that, will they not hear me, says the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Look, tongues are for what? They are for a sign. Not to them that believe. No, but to them that believe not. You see, so if you are speaking in tongues, then what you are addressing or who you are addressing should be people who are unbelievers. Why? Because the tongues should be uh, different languages that you're speaking. Let's say, for example, uh, let me give you a good example. Let's say I go to, I go to uh, Spain right now. I go to Spain and I want to, or, or let me use, I go to uh, Afghanistan and I find people there, they're speaking in Arabic and I don't know Arabic, okay? And neither do they know English. I, I can pray to God and tell him, God, give me tongues so that I can prophesy, I can uh, speak to these people and that they can hear. And God will give, will give me a tongue. And uh, th there are so many cases you hear somebody was speaking fluent different language to other people magnifying and saying the wonderful works of God, just the same way as it was in the book of Acts. Hmm? They spoke in different tongues, in different languages about the wonderful works of God so that the unbelievers can believe by hearing this. And they can say, wow, those people, they are English people and they are speaking Arabic. They truly are God. How did they even know our language? What are they saying? Because God can give you a time and a chance to prophesy and to speak in a different tongue so that other people may be edified. Those who don't know for the unbelievers. Let's continue. 
the unbelievers, okay? But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. So if you're prophesying, what is prophesying? Prophesying is basically uh, explaining what the Bible is saying, opening up a chapter and revealing what God has told you from the Bible. So today we don't have those people who say, oh, I'm prophet this and that. I'm speaking my own things. The Bible is already complete. If you're a prophet, then you should be adding your own pages here in this bible you should be adding your own pages but if you're not adding another word in this bible then you're a false prophet because you should the prophecy which is supposed to be here is you reveal what the bible is saying you reveal what god has spoken and then you tell people this is what i feel god is telling me through this verse through this chapter through this writing that is exactly what prophesying is and if therefore the whole church, listen to this, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, listen to what Paul is saying. If everyone come into one place and all speak with tongues and they are come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they, will they not say that you're mad? <laughs> you're there making noises and, brrr, and all those kind of things. And people come in the church and they find you making all shouting of noises and everybody speaking his own language. And will they not just look at you guys and say, these people are really mad. What are they? Why are those people speaking all these languages? What are they actually even saying? And they are babbling. There's nothing that we can hear. They're not speaking French. They're not speaking German. They're not speaking Spanish. They're not speaking Swahili. They're not speaking local mother tongues. They're just babbling. Bra, 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 bra. And they're saying nothing. And there's no translator. There's no one. That is what we call vain babbling. And I think this Bible is very true and very clear on what it says. Okay. But if all prophesy, okay, if all prophesy, if all people reveal what the word of God is saying, and they are coming that one in, one that believeth not, okay, this is an unbeliever, or one unlearned, is, he, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. If you reveal something which the Bible is saying, then someone who is not a believer, he's going to believe. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Okay. So it's, it's explaining. I, 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 I don't want to speak much about this, but let me just show you one verse here. The Bible says here, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, these are the rules. Listen to the rules. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, the one that they call speaking in tongues, let it be by two or at the most by three, that by cause less uh, and let one interpret. So in short, what he's saying is, if, uh, if there are people who are speaking in tongues and they really want to speak in tongues, which is not refused. The Bible does not deny you to speak in tongues. You can go ahead and speak in tongues. But if you're speaking in tongues, let there be two or three interpreters. Why two or three? Because if you come with one interpreter, you might have arranged with him coming on your way and just say, okay, go and say, tell them that uh, God said this and that. No, let there be two or, a, or three interpreters because at least if there are two or three, if it's a lie, there's someone who will say, mm, no, I'm not in for this or maybe they'll confuse some things and people will know mm, this was a lie. But if there's no interpreter, my friend, why are you making the noise to people? Why are you making noise to people? Look at this. And these are not my words. You can take them to the bank or take them wherever. You see, there are people who will say, oh, Keith, listen. But if there be no interpreter, listen. This is to the people who are speaking in tongues. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Do you keep silence? Do you see them keeping silence if there are no interpreters? Let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. If you don't have an interpreter, speak to yourself and speak to God because he will hear you. Go to a corner somewhere, go and speak to God, okay? Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to one, to another that seated by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be comforted, okay? So this is really, really important. As you speak your tongues, please have an interpreter. If you don't have an interpreter, go to a corner, 
uh, speak in tongues as much as you can silently there speak to god alone don't make noise to people because the bible is telling us here and the bible has nothing to do with you see this one was confusing you see this one. no speak in tongues the bible does not refuse you to speak in tongues but there are rules go and read first uh, corinthians chapter 14 the whole of chapter 14 will tell you the rules of speaking in tongues okay so salvation the holy spirit and speaking in tongues they have nothing to do with each other, okay? These are total independent things, okay? When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside you immediately. So the Holy Spirit is not explained by you having the to speak in tongues that, okay, this guy has the Holy Spirit. No, speaking in tongues is not a proof of you having the Holy Spirit because Ephesians 1.13 tells us so, that you are sealed the moment you believe with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit comes inside you immediately you believe. And you are filled by the Holy Spirit. The more you read his word, you follow his will, and you submit yourself to the things of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear the word of God, the more you follow the things of God, the more you get filled by the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's see. Uh, they, there are several examples. The Ethiopian eunuch. Let me show you. Did the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch... Uh, speak in tongues when uh, he got saved. Let's see this, Acts 8, uh, 37. Did the Ethiopian eunuch speak in tongues when he got saved? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. That is the Ethiopian eunuch. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went out both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught, up, caught away Philip. And that eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Do you see anywhere where the Ethiopian eunuch is speaking in tongues? No. No, there's nothing to do with that because speaking in tongues is not an evidence of getting the Holy Spirit. Let's see also in the book of uh, the book of Acts 9:17. The book of Acts 9:17. All right, Acts 9:17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in thy way as thou comest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes. This is Paul when he was getting saved. And immediately there fell from his eyes that he has been scales, and he received the sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened, and, soul, and then Saul. Uh, certain days then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus is there anywhere where the bible is saying that Paul spoke in tongues no there is no place we don't see the uh, him speaking in tongues we just see he got saved okay that's it okay there is no place where he he spoke in tongues so speaking in tongues is not an evidence of him getting the holy spirit all right let's see also uh Acts 13 I just want to show you maybe three or four verses. Eh? Acts, Acts uh, 13, 12. Acts 13, 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what uh, was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So he believed. After he believed, did he speak in tongues? No, he did not speak in tongues. So are you, are you, are you getting the point? Are you seeing that? Speaking in tongues, it's a very different thing. It's a different, absolutely different thing, okay? Speaking in tongues is something which was specifically to be able to minister or to be able to reach the unbelievers. The tongues, what is a tongue? A tongue is a language. So these people who bubble, who do vain bubbling in church, and they do a lot of bubbling, especially in Pentecostal church, they bubble a lot. And you ask them, where is the translator, bro? Where is the translator? And the Bible says, if you do this, if there's no translator, keep quiet. Why are you not silent? And the Bible says, these people, if they make this noise, all of them at once, if an unbeliever comes here and finds all of them making that noise, will they not think you're mad? That is not my word. That is 1 Corinthians 14. Go and read there. 
And there are so many warnings about this because people are trying to holy lies, the, to make it's as if speaking tongues is, is the holy of holy things. Eh? If you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a pure lie. Let me also show you other examples. Eh? Uh, in the book of Acts, I'll show you about three, three examples as we wind up. Acts, Acts 13, verse 48. Okay. Acts 13, 48. Let's see if these people, they spoke in tongues after they got saved. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained, uh, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. All right. So do we see them speaking in tongues here? No, they are not speaking in tongues. They believed and that was it. Meaning they were immediately after they believed the Holy Spirit came inside them. And because the Bible says nobody can be able to say he is saved like we read before. Nobody can be able to say he's saved unless he has the Holy Spirit. You can never say you're saved unless you have the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is evidence of salvation. So he's not an evidence, uh, uh, speaking tongues, not evidence of the Holy Spirit and, and so forth. Let's see, Acts 14.1. Acts 14, verse 1. Acts 14, verse 1. And it came to pass at Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that the great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Okay? But the unbelieving Jews stayed up to the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected the... See, there's no place after they believe they spoke in tongues. No, the Holy Spirit was sealed in them. Okay, so can you be able to see that there's no mention of speaking in tongues when people believed? And even in the, in the whole uh, Pauline epistles, we don't see tongues and tongues evidences there. No, we only see warnings about tongues. We only see warnings because people are trying to glorify the tongues above Jesus. They're saying, if you don't speak with tongues, then you, you, you're not saved. That's which is purely a lie. Speaking in tongues is a personal thing. If you want to speak, go to a, your corner and speak your tongues there and talk to God in private. But don't involve other people if you don't have a translator. Okay. So there are so many, 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 many uh, different places where I can show you that speaking in tongues has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with getting the Holy Spirit, okay? It is, it is, a, it is a way of speaking, okay? Speaking has nothing to do with uh, getting the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit comes in through you believing, Ephesians 1.13, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So we have to rightly divide the word of truth as according to how 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us. Be a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you have to divide the word of truth. And for those who are uh, who love reading the book of Acts and applying it to themselves, you should know that the book of Acts is a transitional book. And if it's a transitional book, then definitely... Uh, you have to know and ask yourself, so after the transition, where is our doctrine? Our doctrine is from Romans till Philemon, which is the Pauline epistles, who is the apostle to the Gentiles. I believe this has been a blessing to all of us. We have been able to learn uh, something. Maybe if uh, uh, not mine, maybe uh, passports, you can, you can give us your comment. I can see you online. Give us your comment and uh, what you've been able to understand. Can you hear me? Pass, pass, I can see you. Can you tell us something? Uh, I can see probably is a bit uh, far from this. And uh, let, me, let me just um, wind up by saying this. The book of the Bible is, is not, I will say the Bible is not a salad. It's not a mixed grill or uh, it's not a buffet. You cannot say, I'll pick the Bible the way I want. I pick this, I pick this, I pick whatever I want. The same way you see people, they are picking. Uh, I don't want uh, that. You see, I don't want the whole law. I just want to go with the tithe because that one benefits me. I don't want the whole law. I just want to pick Sabbath 
and uh, you know the SDA. I don't want the whole law. I just want to pick this. I just want to pick this. You see, people are just picking what they want. It's not like a buffet where you go and say, I need this piece of meat, I need that. No, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. You have to rightly divide the Bible. And if you don't, remember, let me give you a good example. Right now, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We can't lose the Holy Spirit because the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is sealed inside you unto the day of redemption when you will be redeemed from this body. He's sealed. He's been given a command. Hey, don't come out. You are sealed there until the day of redemption. It doesn't say that he's sealed until the day you sin. He's not saying that he's sealed until maybe a certain time or you reach a certain age. No, he's sealed until the day of redemption because the same Holy Spirit is the one who will raise you on that day. He's the one who will raise you because he rose Jesus. But back in the days, back in the days, the Holy Spirit could come and go, come and go. There was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's why we see uh, David, King David saying, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he was saying, oh Lord, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Why is he saying that don't take your Holy Spirit away from me? Because the Holy Spirit could come and go, come and go. He was not sealed inside us. This is a mystery. The mystery of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is a mystery which was given to Paul. And unless you understand that mystery, you'll be left thinking that, oh, I can lose the Holy Spirit. Oh, I can uh, get the Holy Spirit in some place. Maybe somebody can lay hands on me and I get the Holy Spirit. No. It doesn't come like that. The Holy Spirit comes the moment you believe, okay? The moment you believe, you get the Holy Spirit. And that's why when you get saved, God gives you a changed heart and a changed mind, a new heart and a new mind. And you are thinking differently. You're feeling differently. You are a total different person. You're no longer the person people used to know. You're a total different person. And unless you believe this, and unless you believe the gospel, which is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, unless you believe that, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, for us, then you can never be saved. Because the moment you believe that, and you understand and believe that, the Holy Spirit gets inside you, and it gives you a new heart, and it gives you a new mind, and you'll never be the same again, and you'll never depart unto the day of redemption. So guys, God bless you. It's been a, a pleasure. It's been a blessing. I hope uh, you uh, you are blessed with this. So let's just say a word of prayer as we finish. God, we thank you for this. I will thank you for this moment that you have taught us your word. We thank you. We bless you and we worship you, God. Let it sink in our hearts. Let us understand more and more. Let us live on your way and uh, do according to your will. Lord, open our minds. Let those who have not really understood, Lord, draw them unto you. Bless us all of us and be with us. As we sleep, Lord, guide us and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So guys, have a blessed time. Uh, hope to see you again on Friday. You at the same time, same place on Friday uh, at 9 p.m. God bless you and have a blessed night.